This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. So, Melissa Lecce is the inaugural recipient of the Chairman's Fellowship for Numismatic Research. Uh, this fellowship is currently funding her dissertation research and planned book project, Causa and Socioeconomic Interaction Among Middle Republican Cities in Central and Southern Etruria. She's a doctoral candidate in classical archaeology at Florida State University, where she earned uh, her MA in classical archaeology, and she received her BA in anthropology from Grand Valley State University. Lutke has worked on the cause excavation in Ancedonia, Italy, since 2016, and at the Excavation Coin Inventory Project with the Superintendenza Archaeologica della Toscana, since 2022, actually, she has a forthcoming chapter exactly on that because she's currently cataloging the coins from this, this excavation. Her dissertation investigates the interaction between Cosa and neighboring cities in the 3rd century BCE by re-examining materials from the site, including coin assemblages of regional, regional foreign and Roman origin to determine overlapping circulation patterns and how does inform an interpretation of these relationships. And then, of course, I'm sure you're all happy for me to leave the floor to Melissa. Thank you, Melissa. Yes, thank you. And thank you for the kind introduction. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Get the right one going. Oh, this one. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see it. Perfect. Great. Um, trying to see if I can. Oh, yeah, here we go. Okay, I had to remember how to use Zoom for a second. <laughs> Excuse me. All right, so um, yes, uh, thank you. And uh, thank you to the American Numismatic Society for having me back. Uh, so if you uh, attended the long table lecture about a year ago, roughly, I was discussing our numismatic material from the bath uh, complex at COSA, which is currently being excavated. And I won't be talking as much about that bath complex because it is pretty firmly imperial. Uh, and I'm mainly focusing on Republican coinage for the dissertation research and also for this talk as well. Uh, I also wanted to thank the American Numismatic Society once again for providing the Chairman's Fellowship of Num Numismatic Research. I really appreciated the uh, funding and the capability of completing my dissertation research uh, this past year year, the past couple of summers, and so much so that I'm happy to announce that I will be finishing this fall. So I am uh, slated to defend uh, this October. So um, this is very exciting and I really appreciate everything. All right, so uh, getting into it. Uh, so the title of my talk is The uh, Missing Third Century, Coses Coins and Regional Socioeconomic Interactions During the Middle Republic. So as I already mentioned, uh, the content of today's talk is mainly focused on my dissertation research. And for the purposes of this uh, audience, I'm going to be focusing mainly on the numismatic evidence. But uh, near the end, I'm also going to be bringing in the other types of material, archaeological and otherwise, that I investigated to determine different regional socioeconomic interactions and also where they map onto the distribution and circulation patterns of COSA's coins. So without further ado. So I also wanted to uh, very, very briefly introduce the site of COSA to those who, again, may not have attended last year's uh, talk and also may not know uh, much about uh, Latin colonization, Roman colonization, and the site itself in Italy. So COSA, or uh, as it's known today, modern Ancedonia, Italy, is located on the Tyrrhenian or the western central coast of the Italian peninsula. You can see here it is circled in uh, red. Uh, 
And the site itself has experienced a long history of excavation and exploration, and quite famously in Roman archaeology was considered a type site of Latin colonization or Roman colonization broadly construed. And so the in original investigations mainly focused on determining how close Coza mapped in terms of its uh, structures, Roman, can we identify stereotypical Roman coloni Roman colonization features, such as a forum, curia, comitia, etc. And so throughout the series of excavations that I'll preview in a in a in a minute, we have a complete rendering so far of the city itself, which is located on a tall promontory overlooking the Mediterranean Sea. And what you see here are the walls of the city outlined in black with some defensive towers, uh, three gates, and everything that is revealed here has what has been excavated thus far. So we have a nice kind of overview of the site itself and excavations are still ongoing. So historically, Coza has been both important and also underlooked and also uh, a little bit of an enigma in terms of its textual source material. What we do know from textual sources is that Coza fell, um, or sorry, not Coza fell, Valci fell in about 280 BCE and on the heels of the of Rome taking over the territory and confiscating the land from Valci as punishment, we have the foundation of Coza in what's considered hostile territory, uh, which is predominantly Etruscan in about 273 BCE. And this information comes to us from Livy. Besides the initial foundation and that it was founded at the same time as Pestum to the south, it's considered its sister colony, we don't really have much information about the circumstances around its foundation. So we aren't told how many colonists are sent out. We aren't told uh, the size of the city or how much land. It's just kind of estimated. And we just have the notice that it was founded. We also do not know who the magistrates were who were in charge uh, and the kind of charter or anything like that. Archaeologically and somewhat numismatically, though it differs a little bit uh, there, and architecturally, what we have is a very slow start, or what is what I have termed this missing third century. So despite it being founded in the first quarter of the uh, third century, we're missing a lot of the architectural features. It doesn't seem that the forum was fully built until later in the second century or towards the second half of the third century. The only material that is maybe loosely pinpointed to just after its foundation are the defensive walls that I just outlined in the previous uh, slide, and also uh, a couple of areas in the forum, the road network, etc. There are no permanent housing structures no permanent domestic spaces that have been identified until the second century BCE within the city center. We also don't have a robust public area. So for a long time and still operating under this hypothesis today is the assumption that nobody was really living within the city center. They might have populated the outside territory and small farms and villages after the settlement patterns experienced uh, a change, a significant change after Valci had it taken away. But otherwise, we don't have a lot of evidence for people living, working inside the city center. And that's where this dissertation research kind of fits in, is trying to understand what was happening within the city and within the city's presence within the region during this uh, very confusing time. What we also have from the textual sources is a petition for more colonists from Coza to Rome at the very beginning of the second century. So it seems that Coza was very dutiful in fulfilling its obligations as a colony and uh, sent a lot of manpower during the Punic Wars for both of them, but as a result, the manpower and the people living there were significantly depleted. So they really needed, if they were going to continue building the town, presumably, or rebuilding it in some cases, that they would need more people to populate it. 
The first petition in 199 was seemingly somewhat ignored, but in 197 it was fulfilled, and we do have an account of a couple thousand colonists uh, being settled back into the region. And it seems, though, although with the foundation this wasn't detailed, it seems that with this second petition that was fulfilled successfully, they could draw from non-Romans as well. So there wasn't really anything specified the first time, this time they could kind of pull from anywhere. The second century BCE seems to be pretty prosperous. A lot of building happened. This is when it seems like a lot of the urban center was filled in. A lot of houses were initially constructed. The forum was finished uh, and also reconfigured in some cases. And the territory really thrived during the second century. Moving into the beginning of the first century, we have a significant decline, uh, and this occurred, we think about the 70s, and there have been a lot of theories, uh, mainly the uh, one about pirate attack occurring at the site because we have widespread destruction and burning and a couple of unfortunate indiv individuals who are found uh, with trauma injuries in a uh, cistern. We don't really know. There's nothing said in the sources, the textual sources about this episode, but there is a decline archaeologically and it seems like it had to be rebuilt once again. Thankfully, Augustus stepped in, or under the auspices of Augustus, there was some in early imperial reconstruction, and we also see a jump in the numismatic evidence at this time as well. We have a lot of halved asses, probably dating to the Augustan period, and we have a lot of uh, Octavian and Augustan coinage as kind of an uptick after a decline near the end of the first century. Historically, uh, and among scholars, uh, it seems that there might have been a third century CE decline and originally at this point, it is thought that the site was relatively abandoned, uh, that nobody was really living in there anymore. There was a mass exodus and there wasn't really anything going on at this point. And the coin evidence somewhat supports this, uh, but the ceramic evidence from recent excavations doesn't really support this anymore. What does support this theory is that at least by the 6th century CE, we see almost a complete abandonment of the town. And at this point, a lot of the buildings started to collapse. A lot of uh, the upkeep was not maintained. And even for the bath complex, we see at some point that the building kind of caved inward and the vaulting and a lot of the structures fell down. There's also a running theory that there was might have been an earthquake that happened at this point in time or some sort of natural disaster uh, that could have led to this abandonment, but we don't actually really know. However, there is a little bit of a resurgence in the medieval period. And what we see uh, is some sort of kind of intermittent settlement at this period. So we have smaller areas being populated uh, in the higher areas on the arcs in the eastern heights, kind of the tallest points of the town, and also some repurposed houses. There are uh, medieval necropoli that are discovered and uh, a lot of burials kind of pinned all over the place in those areas. So where they were actually living is still trying to be investigated, but probably repurposing older buildings and making them into uh, smaller settlements. And there is coin evidence from the medieval period as well. So in terms of the excavation history, and I'll go briefly through this um, in the interest of time, but there has been some kind of tentative explorations of the site before 1948, uh, a big kind of meat of the excavations, uh, the, the largest campaigns under the auspices of the American Academy in Rome were done under directorship of Frank Brown from about 1948 after World War II to uh, about 1972. And the 1980 volume that Buttrey published is mainly focused on the coin evidence, the numismatic material from those excavations spanning that long uh, amount of time during that campaign. Uh, the port was also excavated both underwater archaeologically and also on land from about 1965 to 1972 under pioneer Marguerite McCann. Uh, and so we have a lot of better understanding of the workings of the port from those excavations, but also what's missing is how the port has interacted with the hilltop town. It is long thought that they were completely separate, 
But under my dissertation research and other more recent explorations, we think that there may have been a closer tie between the two, even if some material appears at the port that doesn't appear at the hill and some material at the hill does not appear at the port. So there's kind of some gray area there that is meant to be explored later. Uh, then under direction of Elizabeth Fentress, we have uh, excavations for about six years, which was mainly focused on this medieval period and late antique uh, excavations of the site investigations. And uh, from there is where we get the term the intermittent town or intermittent settlement with these different pockets of medieval uh, and late antique settlements. Uh, the, under the University of Granada and Barcelona, we had excavations occurring at the site from 2005 to 2012, mainly focused on a single house, which was also later repurposed into um, a necropolis. And ongoing in the project that I'm currently still involved with as numism numismatic specialist and also trench supervisor uh, started in 2013 is the bath excavations under direction of Florida State University and Dr. Andrea De Giorgi. And we're mainly focused on um, trying to determine at what point the bath was built perhaps why it was built on a waterless hill <laughs> um, where the only water you're getting is from rain. We have no natural springs on the hilltop at all. And also trying to understand uh, the scope of the bath complex, the amount of rooms, where they're getting the water from, the interactions between the cistern, et cetera. And uh, as I already mentioned at the beginning of the talk, I presented on the numismatic material just from those excavations this time last year. And that is set to be published in the next year or two as well. We maybe have one more season, uh, but we keep saying that as well. But we're definitely going to excavate this summer. Uh, and then overlapping with us from 2016 to 2019, the University of Florence excavated another house that they dated to between the second century BC till about the first and uh, early imperial periods as well. And that was pretty close in uh, location to the Spanish excavations. Most recently, and currently being excavated as we speak uh, right now, <laughs> is uh, a new, as of 2023, last September, is this new project of COSA as a Mercantile Center, which is really focused on what I'm most interested in, and I'm also looking at the numismatic material for that project as well the commercial areas of the site. So we've never really found a McKellum or a marketplace area. We've never really found any sort of uh, shops have, haven't really been investigated that line the forum. So with this new project, we're really trying to understand how COSA operated on an economic scale, which feeds into a little bit my interests and my dissertation topic too. And they emailed me yesterday saying they found two coins <laughs> that he already wanted me to identify, but they're both late um, and medieval. So, uh, so more coming from that exciting project. So just to recap, the areas that have been excavated at the site are the forum, the arcs or the main temple area, the sacred area, um, the Eastern height, which now we also have found from LIDAR, some new in, uh, features that are, um, fortification features, earthworks, the walls, around the walls, test trenches around the walls, several houses that dot the area. The one um, outlined here is uh, the area that was done by the Spanish and uh, Florence teams, kind of in this block and this block over here, and the bath building, and then most recent, oh, and the port, and most recently, um, this structure that was long identified as a haram or an area of grain storage or food storage, which now in the current excavations that are happening, um, they're exploring this area and they're thinking it's more of a marketplace, but very, very early to tell. And they've also uncovered a second century BCE house right over in this kind of area off of the forum uh, that may have some wine production associated with it. it might be kind of an early evidence of wine production. So stay tuned for that because that's that's very exciting. So now that I've gone over kind of a background of the site itself, uh, getting into the meat of what I am interested in and how the kind of scope that my dissertation covers. So going back to discussions about this missing third century, I'm interested in determining is it really as empty as it seems or 
is there something else kind of going on at the site at this time period? Now, I will preface it by saying a lot of colonies, it appears, were pretty empty in the first century or so of their existence. And there's a lot of theories as to why that might be, ranging from military camps to um, just not having, you know, a quick manpower to, to develop them or not really being necessary depending on where they've been founded. So operating under that idea, uh, I have a few main research questions that I'm interested in exploring in this research um, or that have explored. So number one is um, how applicable using a geospatial network analysis, which is how I in investigated the material for this research, is applicable to numismatic evidence from COSA specifically. It's been done with other numismatic evidence, but how does it work with what we have from COSA? And what kind of method methodological approach will this kind of help with the nature of the coinage minted by such a small town and a colony as well. So also why do the coins minted by Koza, though, as we'll talk about in a minute, maybe not even minted in the town itself, appear at really specific regional centers, but really nowhere else? Is it really just because it's a regional coinage or is there something else that might be going on in other trajectories with other materials that they may overlap with? Uh, secondary to this question is whether the distribution patterns of the coins parallel other types of interactions between COSA and its regional neighbors. And if we can determine, um, because it seems pretty elusive still, potentially even getting at what these coins were even intended for. If they weren't used financially or fiduciarily, then maybe they were used for some other purpose, either social capital or uh, as maybe some type of bullion. We just don't really know, but they have a really small denomination and very small series. So perhaps we can come up with some other ideas of what they were intended to be used for, if anything. And also, uh, the convergence of the coins distribution patterns and other types of regional socioeconomic interactions, how does that convergence reveal more about COSA's connectivity with other centers during the third and second centuries BCE? Without textual evidence, without robust architectural evidence and archaeological, and even in many cases epigraphic, can the coins reveal a little bit more about what's going on during these time periods? And also, what evidence is there in addition to the coins from COSA for this third century presence of the city? Where is this evidence coming from? What are the contexts that it's coming from? And how can we kind of gather more understandings about this century as a result? So with those questions in mind, those research questions in mind, um, just to give you a scope of the entire numismatic kind of site chronology, uh, the Years here are years of publication, but except for 2024, because this material has not been published yet, uh, it's ongoing, but from both the new and the uh, bath excavations, you can see that the, the height numismatically of the town is roughly between the Republican and just general imperial periods, which maps on to the long held chronological narrative of the town itself, where we have a significant drop off um, leading into the time between the 4th century CE and medieval when it picks back up slightly at about the 10th century CE, with consideration of the amount of illegible coins, which inevitably comes from excavation contexts. So most interesting is this um, kind of uptick from the Republican to Imperial, but not as much when you split out the early to the late, it is uh, not as steep of an uptick. If you lump them together, of course it is. And the, interestingly, over the course of the third to first centuries, we have 333 Republican coins identified from that time period, which is what I'm most focused on for this research. And this is just another rendering of the different types of coins that have come from COSA. Um, and interestingly, with these two excavations, which is pretty minuscule in amount, only about five to seven per you know, respective excavations, one thing to keep in mind is that both of these were houses. So they were a private context, a domestic context, versus a lot of public exploration or public buildings 
investigated here and the bath mainly from here. So we're seeing already more coins coming from public than private areas, just as a whole, comparatively speaking, which wouldn't necessarily be unusual for this type of site. And to break it down for the Republican coinage, um, the time period that I'm most focused on is the third to second century. And I put the two together because it is pretty difficult from the evidence that we do have to kind of piece them apart. Also, because uh, it is long thought that the third century material that does appear at Koza was probably circulating still or being kind of used or appearing in some way into the beginning of the second century as well. So it's really hard to say that they were not related at all. Um, so that is why they kind of make up this this bigger amount. And we see a drop off to the first century BCE. But if you separate these, they might have been a little bit more equal. And then, of course, the inevitable, slightly illegible, relatively uncertain coinage that we can attribute to the Republican period, but not to any one century. Uh, so of the 333 Republican coins, this is kind of roughly how they uh, divvy out in terms of centuries. So for the coins minted by Koza itself, this was a very, very brief period in the town's history. So the coins have been explored uh, at length and really first in the first main treatment of them by Ted Buttry in the 1980 volume Koza the Coins, with the whole first half of the volume dedicated to just the mint alone. And he did a lot of work in uh, proving that they are attributed to Koza, um, and he believed that there was definitely a mint at Koza as well. So the coins themselves were being produced at Koza. The regional circulation patterns tend to support this theory, and that is mainly what he used to support that, that hypothesis. Uh, but whether it was they were minted actually at the site is still unclear at, with the nature of ancient mints, but also because of their close association with Roman types uh, to the south, being minted in the south. There were two very small series, two issues uh, that were produced for COSA. Type 1, which you see here on the left, and type 2, which had two subtypes A, A and B. So type 1 is uh, a depiction of Mars on the obverse and no legend, and a depiction of a horse head with, it's very hard to tell on these ones, some of them it's pretty striking though, uh, a dolphin woven into the bottom of the horse's neck, and often this horse is bridled as well. And you can barely make it out here, but the legend sometimes wraps around, as we see on this example here, or it can be completely around with different letters on different areas, uh, but there is some variation in terms of legend location. But the legend for the first type only appears on the reverse, whereas for the second type we see a uh, legend koza, on the obverse and Koza, Kozan, Kozano, different variations on the reverse. And you'll notice that although sometimes uh, this deity is called Minerva uh, from Buttry and seeming to be a pretty accepted uh, identification is that perhaps with the inclusion of the town name on the obverse in addition to the reverse, we can now think of her as perhaps the personification of the town itself, which is a big statement to make, uh, even if these coins were not widespread and were very small issues and very small denominations. So for the weights themselves, they range from about five to eight grams. Uh, according to Buttry, there is a differentiation potentially in weight standard with type one being a little bit heavier, but not by much with the average weight of type two. And using that analysis, uh, believed that the type one predated type two. By how many years, we can't say, but perhaps this coin was minted pretty close in uh, creation of the colony in 273, whereas this version came along a little bit later, which is, I explore a little bit longer in a chapter, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into here. Uh, also, a troubling feature is whether it is, uh, these coins should be considered corduncia or half litra. 
Traditionally, they were called half litra based on the Achaean um, standard to the south that they are modeling, but more recently it has been posited that they are actually um, very small fractional currency of the Cortuncia, just based on their size, their weight standard, and how uh, they are both similar to the litra coming from the south, but also very dissimilar in a few ways. But as you've noticed, uh, probably just by rote comparison, type 1 tends, tends to pretty closely copy RRC 13 slash 1, one of the first, you know, the first silver diagram uh, issued under Rome with the Romano, uh, which you can see here in the entablature. And there are some features that differ in terms of the a little bit the style of the helmet, the lack of entablature, the tablet at the below below the uh, the horse and instead putting in a dolphin and also this corn ear that is present on the reverse of the RC 13 slash 1 that does not appear on any of the Koza coins. One feature that sometimes appears, though I've looked at many of these coins and it's very hard to tell if any of them really have it, though it is present here, but you can barely make out a star that is often behind the crest of the helmet that sometimes also appears on RRC 17 slash 1. So type 2 is most similar to RRC 17 slash 1, and both have significant dye variation and many subtypes. Even this small issue has at least two subtypes and variation between the subtypes as well. So it is long thought that these two might have actually been minted together. Some have uh, hypothesized that they were minted at Coza, some that they were both minted at Rome, perhaps even in South Italy. Uh, this question is still being explored, and perhaps with additional studies, we can better answer that. Uh, but as of right now, I don't really know whether they could have where they exactly they might have been minted. There are also several theories behind their function. Uh, famously, under Crawford, uh, he believed that perhaps they were minted along with RRC 17 slash 1 to fund the building of the first Roman fleet for the first Punic War at Coza, at Coza's port. Unfortunately, we don't have any evidence at all from that time period, both at the port and in the urban center. It is not thought that the harbor was really robustly built until later in the third century, if not at the beginning of the second. Uh, so it would have had to be a natural harbor that they were using if this theory was going to hold up. But otherwise, there's nothing in textual sources about this, and we have not found anything architecturally or archaeologically to support that. Another theory is that these coins might have been distributed as soldier pay, uh, but there are also complications in their small um, denominations and size, and uh, we also don't think that these were necessarily used in everyday transactions. So there's a lot of complications with how that would have played out as well. And the third and final um, that I've come across anyway, uh, other than just generally we don't know what they would have been used for, is maybe a commemorative issue either one or both of them, at the start of the foundation of the colony, kind of putting Coza on the map in a way that may not have been very economic if they were not very fiduciary, but could have been social capital saying, hey, we're here, or uh, my kind of working hypothesis that where they are distributed, where they end up at these regional set, at this, in these regional centers, could have been putting Coza on the map in kind of a socio-political fashion in creating socioeconomic networks with these historically Etruscan towns. So in terms of regional circulation patterns, uh, this is comes from Buttry's original rendering of the circulation, where you can see that Coza coins have appeared at Telamon or Vitello, which is very close to Coza. You can see it from Coza. Uh, Vetulonia, uh, Clusium or Chiusi, and Carano, Tortoretto, Carcioli, and Vecchi added with um, Catali's uh, 1987 publication revealed that there were 14 Coza coins actually found in various excavations and contexts at Turquinia and also with its port city established in 181 BCE uh, just off the coast of Wisca. 
to date, as much as I would love for this to change, <laughs> there have been no COSA coins found north of Vetulonia and none found south of Rome. This is not the case for RRC 17 slash 1 and obviously not for 13 slash 1 because that was minted both. Well, no, sorry, RRC 13 uh, was minted in the south. So, or we think that was minted in the south. So, very regional in terms of circulation scope, but otherwise unclear as to why the coins are appearing, such a small series, both of them appearing at these locations. So my approach is uh, to look at the numismatic evidence using a type of network analysis. So I won't go into the nuances of network actor network theory and network analyses. Um, if you have dabbled in that or you're aware of it or used it before, then you'll know kind of what I'm talking about. Uh, but in terms of approaches to numismatic evidence, the network analyses have only really appeared in the last few um, decades, I'd say like the last, you know, 40 to 50 years at most. And there have been a few notable uh, numismatic evidence based analyses that have come out in recent years. So Fabian in 2017 used the approach to look at the movement and circulation patterns of coinage in the South Caucasus and at asking similar but in a little bit different uh, questions that I am and using a least cost path analysis, which tries to track direct routes between a point of origin and the movement of something or kind of a route pathway through the geographic space. Um, Termir in 2015 for her dissertation also uh, looked at Latin colonization as a whole and was interested in um, Latin colonies minting their own coinage, why they were minting it, the uh, how they their coinage kind of wove into other types of coinage on the peninsula and looked at this using more of a computational network analysis where we looked at different uh, points and nodes and ties to develop determine the relationships between certain coin types and producers and consumers of the coins. So based on these earlier studies, uh, my dissertation fits in with a geospatial analysis and I'm adding in other materials that may have not been fully considered uh, with previous applications of the network analyses. And I won't go over all of these, uh, but there are several benefits associated with using a network analysis for numismatic evidence in terms of trying to determine how the coins might have moved through the landscape and also relationships between the coins and both their contextual depositions and also with other materials that are appearing. So more of like a contextual based analysis as well. There are obviously some caveats to this. Um, there's a lack of clear chronologies for a lot of these de uh, deposition patterns where the coins are deposited, the hoards, the votive deposits. Um, sometimes it's not really clear and the chronologies may span a really long period of time. So from the third, the whole of the third century BCE, maybe even moving into the second century and so on, because especially at larger votive deposits uh, like Vicarello, you have a long, slow buildup of numismatic material over a long time span. So it's hard to tell exactly when those coins might have arrived at that site. Uh, same thing with challenges of deposition and context and provenance and all of these other kind of missing um, considerations to, to think about. Uh, so in terms of the numismatic evidence, uh, what I ended up doing was overlaying COSA's distribution patterns. Oh, and before I move on, um, what you see here is basically a, a QGIS rendering of Buttrey's original map, which you can see COSA located here and the different fine spots of the coins where they appeared, with the furthest east being over here in Portoretto and moving to the south, but Rome is um, a bit farther down in this area over here. So, I began with looking at, uh, although others have done this before, the overlap between the Koza coins, their fine spots where they appear, and other coinages operating in central Italy overlapping at the same point in time and also in space. So what you see here is Koza's coins appearing in red, and um, I looked at coins 
that and coin producers that appear in the similar locations for the find spot. So even though no Populonian coinage or really Etruscan coinage at all has appeared in excavations at Coza proper, the Coza coins do appear at centers that have Etruscan coinage. This is not an unusual phenomenon, uh, but helps to potentially determine what other relationships exist outside of the coinage between Coza and these centers. So, for example, in orange, you see Populonia and its coinage appearing in different areas in a sort of kind of regional radial pattern. And one or several appear at Telamone, where Coza coins also appear. So we have a relational overlap here. Uh, same thing with uh, Vetulonia over here with a pinpoint there, who also produced its own coinage during the third century, which you see uh, overlapping with Populonia in certain areas here. This site is Vicarello, the famous votive deposit of Vicarello, where interestingly, there have been no Coza coins identified at that fine spot. But as we know, there are a lot of other types of coins, all different types of coins appearing in that singular deposition as well, which is an interesting fact that I explore in a little bit more detail in the actual dissertation. Then we have uh, no overlap with uh, at least this Etruscan coinage at these other sites, but that does not mean that there might other be otherwise be coin and coinage overlapping. And one of these is, of course, the uh, Romano Campanian coins that the Coza coins copy. So RZ13 slash 1 appearing mainly in the south, which does not overlap in circulation whatsoever, uh, except for potentially up here, or sorry, over here, um, kind of on the Adriatic side of the peninsula, and also 17 slash 1, which is the coin type that is supposed to be directly associated with type 2 from Coza's coins. Coza, for reference, is located right here. So there is a little bit more overlap in terms of circulation patterns with 17 slash 1, but it's not exact. And the 17 slash 1 doesn't seem to, at least from the different material, the different uh, find spots that I looked through, cross over much into the eastern half of the peninsula. So that is a question mark as well. But otherwise, the patterns do tend to overlap quite a bit. Uh, then we also have uh, RC 16 slash 1 minted a little bit earlier as well. Uh, and you can see from the potential mint uh, down here that it does have one example, one potential example appears at COSA. But otherwise, we don't really have too much overlap besides in the south, which also trends, um, especially based on Termir's ob observations, that a lot of the overlap would happen with a struck bronze coinage in the south or in South Etruria, rather than over much into the north and also into the east. So that kind of South Etrurian uh, trend continues here. And then, uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into these in detail too, because I know I'm running up. Uh, but you can see that, according, you know, with overlap to the um, Coza coins here in red, we have coins from Naples coming up to the north in this fashion, which they do appear at several of the fine spots, especially those in the east uh, with the Coza coins, uh, not so much with other coinage, uh, other allied coinage to the south, and same down here as well. They don't overlap nearly as much uh, in terms of circulation patterns, although the technology themselves seems to overlap in terms of struck bronze coinage. And finally, uh, we have an overlap uh, a bit, though not perfectly, with Roman cast bronze distribution patterns across the 3rd to 1st centuries BCE or 3rd to 2nd century BCE. And you can see that at many of these points, they do tend to overlap, though still not so much in the center of the Apennines, although that is just a, a hard one to pinpoint because it's not very well recorded, that particular site. But otherwise, they seem to map pretty well with these different areas. So unfortunately, I won't have time to go over 
every single type of interaction that I investigated, um, but just you can see here from the list of all the different types that I did look at from the consumption and production of black gloss pottery and its movement through the regional landscape and also uh, amphora production and stamps because in the second to first century, Koza was a big producer of or a family that lived at Koza was a big producer of amphora. And what you see here in red are all of the different find spots where that cesty amphora appears and the stamps. So in the second century, we see a big shift to the west and opening up that Mediterranean, cross Mediterranean uh, trade routes, which is also typical for other sites in Italy. So it's not just Koza doing this, uh, but it is pretty striking that up until that point, it was a very heavy Western central and Eastern focused in the third century. Um, also interesting is the architectural terracotta similarities, artistic style, artistic similarities uh, between the architectural terracotta at Coza and other areas on the Italian peninsula. So with all of these overlaps, you can see it gets quite messy and I'm going to zoom in on <laughs> uh, just how messy it can be. And everything in red is the Koza material, not just the coinage, but the material itself. And it doesn't really branch out besides to the west later. Outside of the Italian peninsula, we have a couple of amphora stamps coming from Rhodes, which is an interesting connection. And this is RC 13 slash 1, so that's not quite overlapping with Koza much, uh, but we do have a lot of overlap in this western central coastal focus, which Termier also observed in her findings of Latin colonization and in her workings with Latin colonies as well. So this isn't necessarily a new um, revelation in terms of where the material is coming and going. However, for Koza specifically, uh, we highlighted a couple of key interactions that seem to match up with the trajectory of the coins. So at several sites that the COSA uh, coins have appeared, we've also seen some uh, overlap in amphora evidence, amphora production and consumption. Also, uh, really intriguingly, black, black gloss pottery, which was not at least currently associated with production centers at COSA, not in the hilltop, though could be in more recent studies from the area surrounding and also intriguingly from Populonia, but also transportation networks up the coast and with the construction of the Via Aurelia, which is right off of the town and the architectural terracotta, mainly spanning the third to first centuries, again, for lack of ability to pinpoint uh, just to the third century in terms of a lack of material that is able to be attributed to that century alone. So, in the wrap up, <laughs> um, in terms of several conclusions that I've come to from this dissertation research, is that there is definitely an effectiveness of using numismatic evidence in geospatial and network analyses, uh, and definitely in compar comparatively speaking. So, coming up with similar results and also uh, demonstrating the movement of coins, the movement of other materials, the contextual analyses of depositional processes of the coins themselves and how they can be representative of other types of relationships as well and other socio-political economic processes going on. So for COSA specifically, there have been uh, developing close connections between Tarquinia, a traditionally Etruscan, though with close ties to Rome, center, and COSA specifically between the third and second centuries BCE. The three top relationships that have appeared from the analysis are the coins, which 14 coins at Tarquinia puts it at the site with the most Coza coins present from across its excavations and the area. Also, uh, black gloss pottery. Uh, there is a master student associated with the German excavations uh, who's there right now. I had some interesting conversations with her this summer, and she's seeing a lot of overlap too in black gloss pottery production and consumption of very specific forms that come from the third to second century uh, BCE between Coza and Tarquinia. So that is a connection that we're kind of together exploring a little bit more detail. And also um, the production of architectural terracotta at Tarquinia that is being shipped to Coza 
closer to the second century with construction uh, of the temples at Koza. So there's this additional relationship that's been building between Tarquinia and Koza. So my current hypothesis as to why this might be the case is that after Volchi, um, it gets a little bit wiped off the map. It exists, it comes back, but it's very slow. It never comes back in the way that it was under the Etruscan period. After 280, Turquinia and Coza seem to kind of merge in the middle, and Turquinia may fill this void and trade suddenly increases with Coza once Coza establishes itself, and especially with the minting of the coins, trade seems to pick up between the two and goes into the second century as well. There also seems to be a general uh, close relationship along these port cities. So there is a potential not, lead, not to leave Rome out of anything. Uh, Rome shipping materials or moving materials up through Tarquinia and then up to Coza and then even up to Telamone and Betulonia. So that very Western central coastal uh, trajectory there because there are also architectural terracotta styles similar with Telamone. And there are coins appearing at Telamone and also Vetulonia. So there's this kind of um, vertical north-south movement that seems to increase as we move to the first century and beyond. There's also a potential for more third century BCE uh, material coming out of Koza. So in investigations of the bath complex, we had to scan and then forcibly remove a lot of vaulting fragments. And in so doing, we have found a lot more of the numismatic material covered in mortar. And this is not a new phenomenon. It has been published in the past, but it's leaving open the possibility for more third century material having been reincorporated into later phases of building across the long durée of the chronological span of the site itself. So some pottery is coming from, you know, the third century coming from those same contexts. So this is definitely a, a lucrative area for looking at further evidence to support these theories. The biggest one and the most obvious is that Koza becomes increasingly interconnected within its region after its foundation. So perhaps it not, it was not as isolated as previously conceived. Or if it was, maybe it was only a little bit isolated at the very beginning of its foundation and throughout the third and second centuries really became intermixed and tapped into those pre-existing networks, perhaps through the aid of Tarquinia and kind of made its name for itself within the region in a big way, socioeconomically. Uh, we also see overlapping interactions with towns in the distribution patterns. So for Potentially, these coins are acting as representations of, inter of different interactions with similar locations as well. So there's the potential to, to broaden our scope and see if this trend continues with other centers. And um, very quickly, uh, but they could be statements made by Coza's magistrates, founders, and the spread of coinage is a new theory kind of coming up about um, the involvement of elite families at this period, especially in coin production, and the potential at Coza, epigraphically, of families moving back and forth to the east. There are some tenu tenuous connections with Perugia in terms of the epigraphic uh, material from Coza and also some material from Volchi appearing in those areas where Coza coins have also been found. So this is an additional connection that's currently being explored through the combination of epigraphic and coin evidence. So in the interest of time, because I know I've, I've, I've run out, um, just a couple of where this research is going to continue. Um, I'm currently performing a least cost path analysis on the COSA's, on COSA's coinage to see uh, different routes of movement between COSA and where the uh, coins end up. And there are other uh, potential trajectories for the research, such as an actual dye study, um, production output, if that's capable of being uh, determined, and also metallurgical makeup of the coins to compare them on that level. Uh, and there are several dumps at Coza or Middens uh, that are fruitful in terms of additional third century material that has not been fully explored and looking at broader um, 
broken building fragments such as the vaulting that we had to uh, remove from the bath complex for the additional material. So thank you for listening um, and I am happy to take questions and uh, see if there are any additional interesting developments that people might have noticed. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, so as she just said, we can open it up for questions. I see one in the chat already. Does the site have particularly good clay for making amphora? Does it take a special clay to make a good amphora? So I wish I could answer the second question because I'm not uh, a ceramic specialist. So, but I will note it, and I, that's definitely a good um, question to ask. It uh, there have been, I think, in the 70s and the 80s when they were investigating the port, there have been some petrographic and um, clay composition analysis done, and they seem to have uh, determined that. There was an amphora factory associated with the port. There's a significant number of SESTE amphora that come from the port, and also um, the analysis seems to match up. So, in terms of good clay, it seems that it's good enough, at least in that port area or somewhere near the port, to make the amphora. On the actual hill itself, we do not have any evidence, or we have not yet to find any evidence for kiln sites or ceramic production. So, if there is additional production, um, in addition to the amphora, like, say, black gloss pottery, then it's happening where there's probably more available water because water is so limited in the hill on the hill site it seems that the ceramic production might not have been very conducive to that um, that's not to say it might not have happened on a smaller scale though um, but yeah it does it does seem based on compositional analysis to have been decent enough to make at least a medium scale enough for um a wealthy family who later constructs a villa near the port to produce amphoras on a, on a large enough scale to ship them in the cargo over to Gaul and Spain, definitely. But thank you for the question. Do you have any other questions? I mean, you guys know the drill, feel free to unmute yourself and speak. Oh, another one. <laughs> um, RRC 171 are very common. Outside of the excavated material, are there many examples of the COSA types in collections? Are there other cities with the 171 copies? Um, so if I'm understanding the question correctly, um, yes, they are very common. They're a lot more common than the, the COSA coins, which are considered pretty rare. Um, outside of excavated material, um, there are some, if you're talking about museum collections, there are some that are probably coming from, I've been able to trace a couple of them in provenance studies, though very tentatively, uh, to um, certain collectors who obtained them in the 1800s uh, around that time frame in the region around Koza. And there are some very early um, Archaeology archaeologists and and also tentative numismatic scholars from the 1800s, uh, Italian who picked up some Cosa coins in say the region around Chiusi or in some areas there, and they have made their way into museum collections at Berlin. There's one at the American Numismatic Society, which was really exciting for me. Uh, there are a couple in the British Museum. There's a few in the Vatican, and um, I've looked at some of them as well. So there are um, some. But in each, in almost every case, it's like one to maybe max three and one representation of each of the COSA type. Um, and in terms of other cities, in terms of um, other cities in Italy, outside of that regional circulation pattern, uh, which weren't all necessarily excavated examples, because some of them are hoards, some of them are votive deposits, and some of them are stray finds or sporadic, so they might have just been picked up and then deposited in the uh, museum collections where I studied them, they don't seem to appear elsewhere. So just in Italy, just in those centers that I mentioned, um, but yeah, in terms of museum collections, there are others globally, uh, but very, very few. And I have kind of a list <laughs> of where each of those find, and it's it's maybe like 60 coins, so not very big at all. Thank you. All right, you guys have four minutes. Any other questions? 
All right. If not, I'll, I'll say thank you one more time, Melissa. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs>